an eminent philosopher among my friends, who can dignify even your ugly furniture by lifting it into the serene light of science, has shown me this pregnant little fact. Your pier glass or extensive surface of polished steel made to be rubbed by a housemaid will be minutely and multitudinously scratched in all directions. But place now against it a lighted candle as a center of illumination, and lo, the scratches will seem to arrange themselves in a fine series of concentric circles round that little sun. It is demonstrable that the scratches are going everywhere impartially, and it is only your candle which produces the flattering illusion of a concentric arrangement, its light falling with an exclusive optical selection. These things are a parable. The scratches are events, and the candle is the egoism of any person now absent. Welcome once again to The Spouter Inn. I'm Chris. And I'm Suzanne. And this time around, we're going to be reading George Eliot's Middlemarch. It's a big book. It's such a big book. (laughs) This apparently is the year that we're going to be reading big books written by people who are turning 200 years old. It's a birthday year. It's a birthday year. It's a bicentennial year for Walt Whitman, for Herman Melville, and also for George Eliot, whose birthday is going to be coming in November. So this is very exciting. Uh, Before we get too deep into this, I do want to sort of suggest that we will be saying some things that are spoilers in this episode, and there are things that you might enjoy not knowing reading it the first time, although they're not going to ruin your experience, I would say. So if you're a little sensitive to spoilers, go ahead, read the 800-page novel, and then come (laughs) back. But you'll still enjoy reading it. It's not like there are surprise twists that ruin it if you know it ahead of time. And also, one of the things that we might end up talking about really speaks to that. It's a book that I already wanted to read again before I finished reading it the first time. In other words, um, spoilers are kind of irrelevant because it's the texture of what's happening in there. It's the hidden pieces, the like little eddies in the story. Um, those are the things that make you want to come back to it. Absolutely. And yeah, reading it for a second time, it is it is nice to have a sense of the overall scope because it is a massive, massive novel. And there are lots of subplots and lots and lots of tertiary characters and having a better sense of who they are and how they connect to each other on your second reading because you're not as hung up on who the main characters are is is really nice. So so maybe walking into the book for the first time with a bit of an understanding of, of its general shape and contour might be a beneficial thing. I think that's true. You know, as I was finishing reading for today, I kept having these like kind of visual metaphors of what it was that was happening when I was reading it. And it was like looking at an enormously complicated like forest landscape where you could see each one of the individual leaves and you couldn't hold the image of all of the individual leaves in your head at once, but you could see the forest and you could see the individual leaves, but you know what I mean? It would go in and out of focus or else like a house with many, many, many rooms and you were going through it and you could see, you knew the shape of the house and you could see into some of the rooms more in some than others, but you couldn't take in all the rooms at once. So that's what, that's why, like I said, I felt like I wanted to read it again, even before I finished reading it the first time. Yeah. Weird. Very weird. weird. This is also the first book that we're doing in our cluster of philosophy books. And I thought we might take a half second right now just to sort of ask, what do we even mean by that? I mean... Yeah, what are philosophy books? We know what we what mean is by it, right? Yeah. So there's a lot to say about that, especially because, you know, there are also incredibly wonderful podcasts out there about philosophy that deal with literature. In other words, they understand literature as one of the places that philosophy happens, where philosophical work, philosophical thought happens. And so we're kind of coming at that from the opposite end right now, books that are really preoccupied with philosophical commitments. And that's going to play out in one kind of way with regard to Middlemarch, but in very different kinds of ways with regard to the other works in this cluster of philosophy books. I want to do philosophy slash books, philosophy hyphen books. I don't know what term we really want for these. I've been thinking about it as an invitation to read the book in a particular way, that you can approach a book like Middlemarch for its plot and characters, and you can get wrapped up in that. But you're also encouraged to read it for the philosophy that's unfolding through the actions of those characters and and through the words of the narrator, who, as we'll see, has quite a lot to say about the world. But it, it just encourages you to think about this as a space where these ideas are unfolding, where, where, where big thoughts, let's mm. say, are being... <laughs> big thoughts are happening. Thoughts. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. It's a really good way to describe it. And, you know, there's multiple branches of philosophy, and the kind of philosophy that's happening in Middlemarch, above all, is ethics. And there's a lot we could say about that. Um, it's a branch of philosophy. It's a branch that's concerned with the ways in which people act in the world and the motivations for those things and 
why you might do one thing and not another thing. And the philosophical commitments and the other works we read in this cluster are going to be quite different. It's going to be other branches, other aspects. But one of the things that strikes me so much, and I was actually reflecting on this earlier today, is even though we see a lot of thinking in this book, right? We see people thinking and changing their mind. And so we, like, I don't want to use a fancy word, but like epistemology, right? Which is a part of the study of philosophy is preoccupied with knowledge, the nature of knowledge and how that works. Eliot doesn't seem really interested in that, as opposed to somebody like Henry James or whatever, where he's really interested in how you come to know. Like, Eliot doesn't seem all that interested in that, like the cognitive parts of knowing. She's interested in knowing only insofar as it pertains to the kinds of moral decisions you make um, and the kind of morality you hold. I don't know. Do you think that's right? Well, her sense of what it is to know is mostly interested in how do we know about others Mm -hmm. and how Mm -hmm. do we get past the limitations of knowing only the narrow ambit that we can see of the world. Mm. How do we expand that ambit to take in more more and more of the world and therefore have a more generous relationship to other people? Yeah, and the paradox is that some of the most ethically enlightened people in this book, I'm thinking people like Caleb Garth, right, are not like highly educated, like are not highly intellectual people, but in the context of ethical philosophy, they're like brilliant, right? So there's a strange... It's a strangely selective strand of the philosophical tradition here. That's what she's preoccupied with. Well, so this is more or less your first time reading the book, right? It's absolutely my first time reading the book. And I, well, I, you actually write more or less because I, I think I mentioned to you, I had picked it up many years ago. I must have been like in my early 20s or late teens and started to read it. And I didn't stop reading it because I'm like, oh, this is a terrible book. But I was just like, I got distracted. Life happened. So I drifted away from it as opposed to saying, no, I don't want to read this. And it was really interesting reading it now. It made me wish that I had read it when I was a very young person because it's obvious that it's a book that looks, I mean, this is true of all books, right? But it's a book that I think this is especially true of looks very different depending on where you are in life. Like, for example, I found myself incredibly impatient, and we haven't summarized the plot yet, but I found myself incredibly irritated with Dorothea, Mm. you know, and like, I'm like, what is wrong with you? (laughs) But I can imagine that if I were at a different place in life, maybe I wouldn't have quite that same level of impatience with her point of view. I certainly get the sense that people who read this and fell in love with the book when they were quite young and then read it again when they're a bit older, do have a decidedly different take on the characters. And I think part of that is that you do often as a young reader have intense identification with characters like Dorothea, and then you you, you fall away from that. She becomes more irritating, perhaps as she reminds you of your younger self or as, as, as sort of a, a way of being in the world that you don't do anymore and doesn't seem at all aspirational. I don't know. But it can change over time. And yet at the same time, there is a feeling that George Eliot like is aware of this and is writing that for that effect. Yeah. One of the incredibly striking things she does to their characters, and we'll give some examples of this in a little bit. And, and I don't know if you had this experience too. I kept being surprised by the characters. Like I'd be, I'd get a sense of one of the characters who's, who's vain or self-interested or shallow or whatever, like whatever quality they have. And I'd expect them to do a certain thing. And then they would surprise me and do something different. And of course it's Elliot who's surprising us. Right. But that was neat. You know, like it, it's a book that pulls you up short in all kinds of odd little ways. And it's almost always in connection with people doing things that you wouldn't expect them to do, like being a better person than you would expect or a worse person. Well, and the novel was originally published serially. Mm -hmm. So it's made up of eight books that are about a hundred pages each. And they were originally independently published. And because of that, readers who were very, you know, it was a very popular serialized novel, but readers were wildly speculating as to what was going to happen next. It was almost like eight books, right? Yeah. So you can imagine, like you're imagining what the next segment of Harry Potter is going to be or something. Yeah, yeah. And they were similarly imagining what these different characters were going to do. And they didn't do that. Like yeah, everybody got yeah, it completely wrong. Yeah. And yet there was a sense, and I think George Eliot said things to this effect that, uh, well, but they have to do this. Like this is all, this is who these characters are. And this is the only choices that they really had given who they are and what situations they've been Because put in. real people actually do surprise you. I mean, that's exactly right, right? I mean, people talk about this book as being realistic in certain ways, talking about realism in connection with it. And it's that quality, that surprisingness of human beings seems to me a part of that. I w- when I read it again, actually, I really, I think the way I'd like to do it is read them as if they're great books, like read one, put it aside, come back a few days later. That would be neat. That rhythm of reading would be neat. Well, let's go over the plot summary, generally speaking. It's not even going to be a plot summary. It's just a general sense of it because there is way too much plot in this book to cover 
in an hour long podcast. Oh my God, we'd be here for like eight hours by itself. So the subtitle of Middlemarch is A Study of Provincial Life, and the book is in no small part the portrait of the bustling fictional town of Middlemarch, which is in the Midlands of England. It's historical fiction, so it takes place in the late 1820s and early 1830s, which is about 40 years before the novel was written. And so the novel gets to incorporate several historical events, a reform act that goes through parliament to make elections more democratic, the introduction of the railways to the rural town, and the quiet effects of an economic downturn, and things like that. But mostly the novel is following these interconnected lives. So we've got Dorothea Brooke, who at the beginning of the novel is 19, and is remarkable for being not that interested in the normal trappings of girlhood. She's very different from her sister. She's very different from her sister. She's very different from the uncle that has taken care of her since her parents died when she was young. She's very different from the neighbor who is trying to woo her and marry her. She doesn't quite fit in. Instead, she's single-minded about how she can do the best good in the world. That's her driving impulse. And she decides to marry Edward Casaubon, an older clergyman who's working on this learned treatise called The Key to All Mythologies, <laughs> which is amazing. Mm. And Dorothy is very excited to help this learned man do his grand work, unaware of just how far beyond Casaubon's abilities this work actually is. Meanwhile, the other main character is Tertius Lydgate, there's a lot of great names in this book. Oh, yeah. So Tertius Lydgate. Lydgate has just moved to Middlemarch. He's a young doctor with an interest in reforming medical practice and making some great discovery. And he's given a position at a new local hospital, which to him seems very promising. It's a place where he'll be able to do his work and do some good for the town. But then he marries the beautiful daughter of a local manufacturing magnate, Rosamond Vincy. She is not much interested in medical reform. <laughs> Understatement. <laughs> but she is interested in the control that she has over men and in living a lavish lifestyle, and one that threatens to quickly bankrupt the new marriage. Middlemarch, in fact, inverts the structure of a lot of novels, think Jane Austen, by beginning with a marriage rather than ending with one, and exploring what the effects of those marriages are upon characters who grow up quickly over the three years that the novel takes place in. But it's not just about marriage. Middlemarch is a long novel with a lot of plot and other mysterious characters abound, including Casavon's young cousin, Will Ladislaw, uh, as well as Nicholas Bolstrode, a banker who's full of self-righteous religion, but who hides a shameful past. Now, these are mysteries that eventually get revealed, and the characters who hope to do some good in the world have to learn how to do this within an imperfect, complicated world filled with people who stubbornly have their own emotions and, and motivations. That is an incredibly good summary of an incredibly complicated book. And, you know, when you were, when you were talking about the name of the place and this little world that we're seeing, it's a, it's a small town, right? Everybody knows each other. Um, they're all interwoven. And like the, the name she gives to the town and also the subtitle, Provincial Life, I keep thinking about space, you know, like middle march, like middle. And also a march is like a border or a frontier, right? So like what kind of place is this? And provincial, like it's not the urban centers. It's and it's not super, super rural, right? It's provincial. It's like in, in between space. And when you think about the time of the novel, that even gives us a stronger sense of in between this, right? Because, you know, us looking at it from the early 21st century, we're like, oh yeah, it's like 19th century is all the way back when that's when the book was written. But there's this really interesting gap between when the novel set and when she's written it. Like you said, it's like around 40 years. So it's far enough in the past when the book's written that people are thinking about it as the past, but it's like the proximate past. And she keeps calling our attention to it. Like, she has this weird thing where she talks about women's clothes over and over mm, yes. again. Like, she'll allude to the style of that time and she'll describe it to you in a very concrete, vivid way. So it's like the past, but it's a past that's kind of connected to us in the same way the space is. It's like, it's a, it's an in-between space. I don't know. If, I mean, I don't know if that's a silly thing to say, but I find that really striking. It's something that she makes a great deal of. Again, the clothes is a particularly interesting place because whenever she describes someone's clothes, she then makes fun of it for being an old-fashioned style. But yeah. like it was clearly the style at the time, and she and she's aware of that. So she's she is playing this game where she's saying this thing is different from you, but remember that to them it meant this. Yeah. Oh, well, there's a beautiful example of that at one point. Uh, it's around almost in the middle of the book when there's two female characters being described, uh, Dorothea, who we're going to talk about more in a moment, and the wife of Tertius Lydgate, uh, Rosamond is her name, Rosamond Vincy. And what we hear about them in the moment of their meeting, the door, the door opens and they come in the room to meet one another and their clothes are described. And so it says this, 
When Dorothea entered, there was a sort of contrast not infrequent in country life when the habits of the different ranks were less blent than now. Let those who know tell us exactly what stuff it was that Dorothea wore in those days of mild autumn, that thin white woolen stuff soft to the touch and soft to the eye. It always seemed to have been lately washed, always in the shape of a pelisse with sleeves hanging all out of the fashion. And then there's like a whole longer description of what she's wearing on her head and all that kind of stuff. So there's like this elaborate description of the clothing, like vivid and not just vivid, but what the feel of the fabric was that was on her body. Like, it's so weird. Um, and then Rosamond, by contrast, gets described in a way that emphasizes not her clothes, but um, the way her hair is. So here, the women were both tall and their eyes were on a level. But imagine Rosamond's infantine blondness and wondrous crown of hair plates with her pale blue dress of a fit and fashion so perfect that no dressmaker could look at it without emotion. A large embroidered collar, which it was to be hoped all beholders would know the price of, her small hands set off with rings. Right? So there's this very elaborate physical description and it's so different from somebody like Austin where that would be ironic like it would be kind of in a very subtle way tearing people down instead here the clothing is telling us something about what kind of person would wear that clothing it's a it's a neat quality I think well I don't want to say that she is so to speak above using descriptions of clothing to tear people down no, no, that's, true. that's true there's a there's a another fantastic moment with uh, rosamond who is very vain oh rosamond i love rosamond she's, she's so bad yet so appealing mm-hmm. yes <laughs> the, the the uh she does this wonderful thing i just have to say she's this wonderful thing when she's like sort of tormenting her husband earlier her father but later her husband like they'll tell her to do something and she just has this way of like kind of turning her neck <laughs> and you know consciously preening and looking beautiful and also being utterly obstinate as a mule at the same time at one point, the narrator says it was it was part of Rosamond's cleverness to discern very subtly the faintest aroma of rank, and once, when she had seen the Miss Brooks, i.e. Dorothy and her sister, accompanying their uncle at the county assizes and seated among the aristocracy, she had envied them, notwithstanding their plain dress. Which is both a kind of dig at the Brooks, but also a dig at, at Rosamond. Absolutely. Yeah. No, she's shallow and materialistic in ways that we will see in excruciating detail. So Middlemarch, as I said, covers two main threads, one of Lydgate coming and trying to revolutionize doctoring. But the first one that we meet, and the one that I think most readers fixate upon, is the story of Dorothea. How would you describe Dorothea? God, I have very conflicted feelings about Dorothea. (laughs) So um, it's clear that we're meant to, if not identify with her, we're meant to understand her as the central figure. If there is one central figure in this sort of swirling crowd, she's it. Because she stands out as being odd, like she's different, right? She's different from her sister who's conventional in certain kinds of ways. Odd, yet also not like abject or outcast, like she's clearly beautiful. She's attractive in certain kinds of ways, attractive to people in different kinds of ways. Um, She's clearly well-motivated. As you said earlier, she wants to do good in the world. This is the thing she wants. And the the two storylines we follow most, that's Dorothea and Lydgate, they're very different characters, but they're both, I don't want to say that they're idealistic, though I think she is. They both want to do good things in the world. They want to change things. They want to have an impact on the world for good. And that sounds so simple, right? It's like a, it's like a monosyllabic phrase. They want to do good in the world, right? But it's so complicated to actually do that. It's almost impossible, right? It's like they have this very pure and simple intention, and it's like they're wandering in the woods, for like 800 pages to to try to do it, right? Because to actually do good in the world is unbelievably difficult. It's also very difficult if you are well-intentioned and intelligent, but that there are things that you don't know about. And Dorothy doesn't know about a lot. Oh, yeah. Because she's grown up in a very cloistered environment in this small town surrounded by people who are not interested in the sorts of things that she's interested in. And limited education. She has limited education. She has no mentors. She has nothing like that. She just has aspirations and things that she's picked up from the very limited amount of reading that she's been able to do. Which is why she ends up in that marriage, right? She wants to learn. She wants to serve. She wants to... She thinks that's going to be the vehicle for her. So the first man that she meets who is at all different and at all intellectual, she gets fixated upon. Mm -hmm. And everybody around her is unconvinced that this is a good pairing. Like, no, yeah. (laughs) But she's determined. But she's determined. Edward Cassavan, this much older man, he's about 50. Just awful. (laughs) (laughs) Cecilia, Dorothea's sister, who is much more of a normie, (laughs) she's smart about some things in ways that... She is. She's insightful and smart in, in certain ways. In other ways, like... She's absolutely not interested in anything no. that Dorothy is interested in. And so when she meets Kasabin, and he is not typically handsome like 
Sir James Chetham, the, the man who is trying to woo Dorothea. She says, how very ugly Mr. Casalban is. And Dorothea responds, Celia, <laughs> he's one of the most distinguished looking men I ever saw. She has not seen many men. Yeah. He is remarkably like the portrait of Locke. He has the same deep eye sockets. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> no. <laughs> Wait, and then you, you have to go on. Celia says, had Locke those two white moles with hairs on them? <laughs> have you seen the portrait of Locke she's talking no. about? No. Oh, we'll put a link in the show notes. <laughs> and I will load it up real quickly. Tell me what you think of this hottie. Oh, man. Oh, man. <laughs> I mean, he's a person. He looks like a person. But it's, it's these incredibly sunken eyes, this incredibly narrow, gaunt chin. Yeah. What tells you, though, what she's looking for, right? She's looking for someone who, to her, to her 19-year-old, like, undereducated self, reads as wise and intelligent and thoughtful and a scholar. Someone who she can, like, kind of be their, I don't know, acolyte? Or disciple that she can serve and by serving them do good things and one of the models of who she's looking for is john milton like you read that you're like oh man <laughs> she gets very excited about the possibility that she could have she could have married john milton and and been his amanuensis yeah. and you know taken his notes and done all this work while he's going blind and she just thinks of the nobility of helping a great man like that what didn't it strike you though what she's talking about there is the experience of milton's daughters of course we know which we talked about when we were doing paradise lost so it, it, i mean that's a significant thing she's she's looking to be how can i put it she's ending up as a wife but she's kind of looking to be a daughter like she's looking for an older wise man who will teach her yes elliot talks about it in the first chapter this like awesome moment the really delightful marriage must be that where your husband was a sort of father and could teach you even hebrew if you wished it and i read that and i was like oh wow <laughs> But, you know, but that's that's the privilege of living when we live now, right? Like, say you grow up in an environment where the opportunities to learn are super, super, super limited. We talked about this when we were reading Mary Shelley, right? If there's if there, if there that's the path, if that's the only path open to you, well, I guess you take it, right? Exactly. That's the only way that she can imagine learning the things that she wants to learn. And she does. Remember her Latin gets better? Oh, yes. Remember? Like, she does learn stuff. Absolutely. She, she eventually manages to learn all sorts of things and, and have that entire library that Kasabin has built up. Uh -huh, uh -huh. They get married, though. Ugh. And, <laughs> and oh, boy, the, uh, the letter proposing is delightful. And just go read it if you haven't read this book yet. Absolutely treat yourself to reading this incredibly awkwardly written <laughs> letter. But they get married very quickly. They go off on honeymoon to Rome. And it's terrible. Oh, my God. And, and it could be so wonderful. And she's aware of this. She thinks about this all the time. It could be very different. Because Kasabin is not actually interested in supporting his wife and, and teaching her. Yeah. No, he's only interested in his, like, key to all mythologies, right? His his albatross. <laughs> so, on, yeah, exactly. So on the, on the honeymoon, he is spending time in the libraries and ignoring her and not really including her in any of his work or thoughts, which drives her crazy, basically. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this sort of only gets... Worse and worse as as it goes on, as well, the marriage as she, continues. Yeah, as she becomes more insightful, I mean, he comes, I don't know if this is saying too much, he comes to hate her, I think. You know, he comes to the point where he's beginning to feel that she sees his inadequacies. And for him, this is unbearable. Exactly. Much later on, after they've been married for about a year, there's a passage in which he thinks, there is no denying that Dorothea was as virtuous and lovely a young lady as he could have obtained for a wife. But a young lady turned out to be something more troublesome than he had conceived. She nursed him, she read to him, she anticipated his wants and was solicitous about his feelings, but there had entered into the husband's mind the certainty that she judged him, and that her wifely devotedness was like a penitential expiation of unbelieving thoughts, was accompanied with a power of comparison by which himself and his doings were seen too luminously as a part of things in general. His discontent passed vapor-like, through all her gentle, loving manifestations, and clung to that inappreciative world which she had only brought nearer to him. Mm. He's a man who's lived his whole life, cloistered up, doing his work, and letting it germinate, mm -hmm. barely letting out little drips of, of short notes and queries, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and not not actually producing the great work that he's trying to do, partially because he is worried about the reputation of it. He's worried about having people to look be, at his work. It has to be good enough. He's right? a perfectionist. Yeah, yeah. And letting somebody into his life who he hopes will just make it a little bit more perfect. But it turns out Dorothea is a person and a very smart person and, and was interested in him because she was smart. But this intelligence is a threat to him mm -hmm, and he mm -hmm. becomes paranoid about it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
you were saying he's a perfectionist, and I think that's right, but it, it's a little bit more than that, maybe, or a little bit different from that. Um, he he has spot, the, the title of the book gives away the key to all mythologies. Like, what is that? You know, it's just <laughs> insane, right? Um, all mythologies, like you're going to write one book that's about all mythologies, and it's going to explain it all, so it's all like unitary and simple. And it, it's an impossible task. And you get a little glimmer of how that's playing out and the impossibility of it and his partial awareness of its impossibility when there's a moment when he's reviewing his notes with Dorothea. He's like anticipating that his life may not last all that long and that somebody else may have to finish out the project for him. And so he's having her, you know, sort of annotate the, the outline basically. So he's got this outline and he goes through it with her and he says he's had to make the decision to include just one or two examples for each of the key points as opposed to all the like 42 examples or whatever it is he has for each one of these points. In other words, it's encyclopedic. It's like absurdly capacious. Um, and he's having to figure out how do you, how do you actually distill that into one book? And he can't do it. It's impossible. It's like a hopeless task. And in some ways it's like, it's funny and it's contemptible and you have scorn for him, but like who among us is not, who among us who has written anything has not felt a little bit of sympathy for that. It's like, yeah, you know, like he's ridiculous, but it's also there's something poignant in that. And Dorothea responds to that. But there's an interesting moment in that when we're hearing some of this resentment that's coming up between the two, and they've come home from their honeymoon, mm. and the narration is just going on as it was. And it says one morning, some weeks after her arrival at Lowick, back home at Casalbin's house, Dorothea. But why always Dorothea? Was her point of view the only possible uh. one with regard to this marriage? And it's this really interesting moment in the text where we're suddenly like, we're trained to sympathize with Dorothea. And Kasabin is clearly set up to be this like increasingly bad guy. And yet, mm -hmm. Elliot comes in and is like, well, It's a startling moment. Yeah. It's a, it, like, no, we're not going to, it's not going to be that easy for you, reader. Let's take a moment and think about this from Kasabin's perspective and like what his environment is, what is motivating him. Mm -hmm. Let's, let's humanize him a bit mm -hmm. now that we've built him up to be a bit inhuman in certain mm -hmm. ways. Yeah, that fits in very well with what I was saying earlier about characters surprising you. Mm -hmm. You know, that this is another very surprising moment that but now coming from the narrator to like say, well, you know, people aren't necessarily what you think they are. You might want to consider it from this other side as well. While they're in Rome, Dorothea encounters Casabin's cousin, who she'd met once before, right before the marriage. And he recognizes her when he sees her in Rome. Exactly. And while Kasabin is out at the libraries, Will Ladislaw, who is, again, a cousin and one who is receiving a bit of income through Kasabin, but they don't like each other. <laughs> no, no. You get the sense that Kasabin is doing his duty to Ladislaw. But... He's doing a very reluctant duty. And Ladislaw is sort of resentfully taking the money as well. And in fact, not long after that, he will reject the money. Mm -hmm. But he encounters Dorothea and they have a conversation. And this is the first clue that Dorothea gets that maybe, maybe Kasabin is not actually as brilliant as And it's devastating to her. Yeah. Because of course she believes it's her wifely duty. Well, to, she's built her life on this. She's both built her life on this and she believes she is required to defend him. And yet what Ladislaw is saying seems fairly accurate. It sets into motion two different things. First, her increasing disillusionment and her awareness that Kasabin is not the be-all and end-all of intellect and yeah. manliness, yeah. but also her transference of some of that emotion onto Ladislaw, who suddenly seems like a different kind of intelligence. Well, yeah. I mean, the, how can I put it? There are a number of things that draw her to Ladislaw, but one of the things I, I seems to me that draws her to him is he's the one who's kind of punctured her fantasy of what Kasabin is. Right. Like on the one hand, she's deeply disturbed by what he said. What he says is basically that not just is this an overreachingly, ridiculously and amb overambitious task, this key to all mythologies, but that if Kasabin read any German, he would know that a lot of this work has been done. <laughs> you know, which is like a great moment. Right? Um, um, and, and he sort of basically exposes the limitations of Kasabin's scholarship. And Dorothea is not in any position herself to judge the merits of Kasabin's scholarship, but she knows enough to recognize that what Ladislaw is saying could be true. And so on the one hand, this is deeply disturbing to her, but also like she looks up to him, right? I mean, because he kind of can take Kasabin down in that sense by criticizing him in that way. And she begs him not to ever say that again, not to tell it anybody else, right? She's still very protective of Kasabin, but you know, it makes an impact on her in other ways. So what's your take on Ladislaw as a character? 
I think he's kind of irritating, you know. <laughs> I mean, he's really passionate, you know, he's a lot of feelings, he's an eloquent speaker. Um, so he's an interesting character. And the thing I find most interesting about him is he's clearly someone whose family history, like on the one hand, his family history is all bound up in the stories of the town of Middlemarch and, and that whole dynamic. But the other part of his family history is bound up in the revolutions of 18th century and early 19th century Europe. Like, because if you sort of think about like his family background and how that all plays out, the political unrest of the late 18th century lies behind that part of the family plot. And he is someone who's, you know, very politically engaged. He's clearly a speaker who can rouse people up, right? And one of the reasons that's so striking, you know, we talked a little bit earlier about the gap between the time that Middlemarch is set in, 1831, and the time that the book comes out, which is in the later 19th century. What's happened in between then is the revolutions of 1848 in Europe. Right. So tremendous political unrest, right? Particularly in the urban centers, but not only in the urban centers. So a lot of things tr are transformed in the course of the 19th century. We see the railways, we see political changes in the legislation that are going on in the background. But the thing that's going on that's kind of visible and invisible um, is revolution. Um, and Ladislaw is clearly like connected with that. He's like the part of the iceberg that's above the water. Uh, with regard to revolution. You see a couple other moments. There's this one moment where two characters, um, Caleb Garth and Fred Vinci, uh, and a couple of other people are out. Um, they're doing some work and, um, there are some local peasant types who accost Caleb Garth and, um, someone else with their pitchforks. And, and it's a moment that really stands out because some of this kind of comic, it's easily dealt with, it drives the plot forward, but it's also like that stuff can happen. That can, that, that there's a simmering a pot that can kind of boil over. And um, Ladislaw is one of the places that you also see the, the pot that's bubbling in the back of the stove. Yeah, Ladislaw is very interesting. His grandmother has been rejected from the Casalban family for marrying somebody that they didn't like. His mother then runs away from her, the grandmother in order to live off her own life and to marry somebody that also wouldn't be approved of. She runs off to join the theater and, and she marries a, a, a Polish man. And and it's just it's just a, a generation after generation of independent-minded people. Mm -hmm. And Ladislaw himself, like his chief characteristic is he demands to be independent and have an integrity in that. And yet he is, he's so quick to that, that it, you know, comes back to haunt him. He's like, he has to, he, the thing that Ladislaw has to learn is a little bit of self-control yeah. and a little bit of trying to fit in with other people and not just say whatever is on his mind. Yeah. Even though it's that blunt honesty that is paired with Dorothea's aggressive simplicity of yeah. speech. Like she's always just saying the things that she's thinking in it's very simple in a way, but she's very pure and it comes off that way. Whereas Ladislaw can be very cutting and he has to learn to not be quite as cutting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the best thing about him, maybe the most admirable thing about his character is that he loves Dorothea the way he does. Mm. Like, not just loves her, but like admires her, like values her. Like, I think if there's something we're meant to admire in Ladislaw, I think it's got to be that, that he sees that in her, that he values that in her. Well, there's that, but also I think he is generally interested in political change yeah. that I think we would also stand behind. Yeah. Well, is he is he interested in political change? And I wasn't sure about this. Is he interested in political change because you know he believes in it? Like he he has real political convictions that we could, as you say, get behind? Or is it about his own kind of advancement? I, I couldn't tell. Well, I think it's a little of both. Yeah. It's a way for him to be independent, but it's also a way for him to, in a different sense, although he never talks about it like this that I can remember, uh, to do a bit of good. Mm. Um, certainly he sees, he seems to see injustice in the world and want to do something That's about true. it and is fairly effective at it, I guess. And, and ends up eventually sort of after the novel's over in the, in the epilogue, his future will lead him to being a member of parliament. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think there are some other instances where you see him interacting with the poorer people, because although we've been talking about how this is an interconnected novel of people, like most of those people are very much upper class. Yeah. We do see other classes represented, but they tend to be, I want to say a little Dickensian, like they're, they're not fleshed out as f full characters, generally speaking, though there are some that are fleshed out very beautifully that are kind of at the periphery of these upper classes that have some points of connection, like through the Vinci family and the Garths and so on, we get a sense of that. Yeah. And we also get a sense, there, there are a few moments where the narrator comes in to, to sort of comment about this, mm. where she makes the case that one of the reasons why this is all about upper crust people is because that's what we want to read about. Oh, yeah. So, so there's an interesting dynamic to it. But yes, you're right that, that a lot of these scenes with the lower class people are more about 
a bit of caricature, a bit of a mm. bit of like comedy, while also showing the actual like poor conditions that they are living under because of people like Dorothy as uncle. And again, their clothing and things like that get described. You know, oh, yeah. like that that tells us something about who they are. You know, before we leave um, Dorothea, there was one thing about her that I was so struck. You know, we we're talking about her clothing earlier, and she is she, she gets described in physical terms in more than one way. She gets described in physical terms with regard to her clothing, but she also gets described in physical terms in a couple of different places where she's described in terms of her purity, like it's either whiteness or light or clarity, or she's like a flower. There are all these interesting metaphors, right, that, that represent a kind of I don't know. The word purity doesn't get used, if I remember correctly, but it gives you that sense. But in a very particular way, there's this one moment where um, it says, to ask her to be less simple and direct would be like breathing on the crystal you want to see the light through. Mm. And I think that's such a powerful example of that, right? because again, it uses clarity, purity, it's compatible with her way of being very direct in her speech and all that kind of stuff, right? And this is a way that She's very different from Lugate. We were saying before that, like, there's comparable, they're, they're the two storylines that we follow the most. They're both people who want to do good in the world. Like, there's a lot of parallelism. But she's like, I want to say she's a subject, right? She's active in the world, but she's also like, I don't want to say objectified in a bad way, but like, she's also a thing in a way that Lugate isn't. He's not a thing, right? He's just a subject. Uh, but the thing she is, is like, something you refract light through, right? She's like, there are these optical metaphors that show up here and there throughout the book, and she's right at the center of that. Um, so she inhabits this really interesting place with regard to the whole moral economy, the whole ethical economy of the book. And that crystal, I mean, that that's her focusing, I think, that, that ethical set of commitments. But why always Dorothea? Let's take a moment <laughs> to talk about our other main character, Lydgate. What do you think about her? I think that the Lydgate story is less exciting than the Dorothea story. These originally were meant to be two separate novels. Oh, wow, really? And she realized that they could combine together and form something greater, which they probably do. Well, they do because there's this intersection, right? This exciting intersection near the end of the book. Oh, yeah, 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 which we'll get to in a moment. But but you have the sense of this novel of Lydgate coming to town with high-minded ideas about what he's going to be able to do and then getting dragged down into small-town politics. Which he does not have the capacity to no, navigate. No, no, not at all. And he makes a lot of poor choices along the way. The most interesting of those poor choices is his marriage. Oh, yeah. I guess part of it is, is it a poor choice? It's certainly not what he thought he was getting into when he decided to marry Rosamond, this beautiful young local woman who's who he completely misinterprets. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess he was doomed to make a poor choice one way or the other, right? Because we get a little bit of a sort of backstory of Lydgate back when he was in Paris and he like fell in love with some actress who turns out to have killed her husband, right? It's like, yeah. <laughs> clearly he's like not real well at choosing potential partners. But again, you know, we're talking about, before about characters surprising you. you. You think that relationship is going one way and it is kind of, right? It's, it's like, she's she's... You know, vain and extravagant, and he doesn't know how to manage a household. Like, they're just like, it's like bad, right? And they don't support one another, and it's just like terrible. But then, you know, it turns out, I don't want to say well, but it turns out to be bad in ways different from what you might expect. Like, she, she has a capacity that you never imagined she had. But at the same time, it doesn't feel like the character. I guess that's what's extraordinary about the characters in Elliot. The characters surprise you, but you don't feel that the character drawing is inconsistent. Right. Which is so remarkable. Right. Normally, like a less gifted writer, if you had a character do something unexpected, you'd be like, oh, bad writing. But that's not what happens at all. You're like, at, you're, you think this is a person. This is like a person you know. And she's like, wow, I can't believe she did that. But you don't for a minute stop thinking it's her. Well, there's a lovely passage uh, about Rosamond early, at, at one point, after they've been married for a while. Rosamond felt herself beginning to know a great deal of the world, especially in discovering what, when she was in her unmarried girlhood, had been inconceivable to her, except as a dim tragedy in bygone costumes, that women, even after marriage, might make conquests and enslave men. Mm -hmm. And this becomes her fascination, and she decides to see how much power she can wield over her husband. Yeah. And then tries to do this as well over Ladislaw, uh -huh. which doesn't go as well because Ladislaw is fiercely independent as his main character trait, and that's just not going to yeah. he's not going to play with that game. But Lydgate's entrapped by it because he's he's got his own sense of what their relationship is. Yeah, she's this beautiful woman who's gonna make the household lovely for him and gonna be, you know, just intelligent enough to make a good wife. Right? Like I mean he doesn't exactly. want more than that really. Yeah, and he want, he wants somebody to adore. Mm. And that's what he wants. Yeah. 
you know, one of the things that struck me so much, like I, mean, I found, the, I found you were saying that of the two storylines, the Lydgate and the Dorothea storyline, you find the Dorothea one more interesting. And I, I find that somewhat interesting, but I found the Lydgate one incredibly interesting because I find that relationship with the two of them interesting. Like, I find Rosamond very interesting. Like, she's a shallow character. She's beautiful. She's vain. She's like, you know, stubborn, right? Unimaginative, all these things. But what struck me so much is like, I spent the early part of that book being irritated with Dorothea for being like, you know, why don't you say to Kasaba and, you know, like you jerk, you know, no, I'm not going to do this thing you want me to do or whatever, like for not imposing her will, not being assertive, but Ro- that's what, exactly what Rosman does, right? You know, like Lydgate wants to, you know, handle their problem of debt in one way and she's like, mm, I'm going to handle it this other way, <laughs> you know? Um, like she, she's wrong, right? But she doesn't hesitate to, to act, Yes, right? She's, she acts in an independent way. Um, and, and what this reveals for us is that acting independently isn't always a good thing, right? It depends, right? Yes, that's very much what Rosman needs to learn, I suppose. Yeah. But one of the things that I was really interested in about Rosman's story is how delightful that notion of the woman who realizes that she can enslave men can mm. be to us. Like mm. we get we get very excited, or I get very excited about that sort of thing. There are lots <laughs> of like great early 20th century movies about the women who get their power and then I mean also Helen of Troy, you know? I mean <laughs> Sure, exactly. This this is a, this is I guess a common this trope. This is a thing. But also I don't think I don't think George Eliot was as delighted by her no, as this. No, I, I My understanding is that uh, she found Rosamond the hardest character to write and write sympathetically. And in fact, this is one of the reasons why the climax of the novel oh, it's so is amazing. so striking. Mm. Because it is a scene in which things have gone terribly for Lydgate. They're running out of money. There's all this. T- and, and the marriage is about to fall apart. And it seems like the only way to save it is for Dorothea, who doesn't know Rosamond at all, almost. Slightly. They've met once before, to visit and to have a talk with her. Yeah, sort of speak on behalf of Lydgate. And she she volunteers to do this in a conversation she has with Lydgate. And he's like, he doesn't really think anything's going to come of it, but he's like, why not, right? And the first time she tries it... Mm, goes very wrong. It goes very wrong because the first time she tries it, she arrives at Rosamond's house and sees Ladislaw there and... It just they're in an bad. emotional situation. An emotion, yes. I mean, they're not like in a passionate embrace or anything like that, but it's clear there's an emotional conversation happening between the two of them, a man and a woman alone, right? And that's enough. She doesn't need to see more. She just leaves. Exactly. And yet she has a good think about it. She puts it aside. She knows what she has to do or she, she believes she has to do. To do. She world. wants to do good in the world. So she gets back on that horse, gets back in that phaeton, goes back <laughs> over and talks with her through all her anger about this possibility that the relationship that she wants to have with Ladislaw is is now dashed, she manages to talk with Rosamond. And they end up in this, I want to say embrace. I mean, they end up in this physically proximate kind of situation. Like, it's, I think, the most emotionally intimate moment of the book. Oh, absolutely. It's so strange. And yeah, they talk over various parts of their situation and are just reduced to tears. And it's a beautiful chapter. Yeah, let me read a few lines of it. It's so extraordinary. The waves of her own sorrow from out of which she was struggling to save another rushed over Dorothea with conquering force. She stopped in speechless agitation, not crying, but feeling as if she were being inwardly grappled. Her face had become of a deathlier paleness, her lips trembled, and she pressed her hands helplessly on the hands that lay under them. Rosamond, taken hold of by an emotion stronger than her own, hurried along in a new movement which gave all things some new awful undefined aspect, could find no words, but involuntarily she put her lips to Dorothea's forehead, which was very near her, and then for a minute the two women clasped each other as if they had been in a shipwreck. It's like... Whoa, what is going on there? Exactly. How intense is this? And yet, I mean, it's two storylines, but like when they come together, it's like, whoa. Yeah. And it's just remarkable. Yeah. And it transforms Rosamond. I mean, she's not all of a sudden good, but she's capable of acting and feeling and behaving in a way a little bit different. You know, as we're talking about Dorothea, it occurs to me, I hadn't thought about this before. It's a little bit like Saint's Lives. So if you think about Chaucer's Man of Law's Tale, for example, you remember Custanza, Constance, the, the main character, uh, all her loving who looked good in her face, everybody who saw her uh, her face loved her, right? She has this transformative quality. People just have to look at her and it does a thing to them. And so there's a wave of conversions that happen. And it's a kind of a pattern of behavior that you find in saints' lives. And so I'm not saying Dorothy is saintly or anything like that, but this transform, like she's a crystal, right? This transformative quality, um, even, and maybe above all, with Rosamond. Right? It's not just men right, that she acts on who, who are in some way changed by her. It's not 
just about like love relationships, right? It's, she, she has an effect on Lydgate. She has an effect on a lot of people. And I think importantly, Rosamond. Well, and of course, she is specifically being framed as a saint. Saint Teresa. Saint Teresa of Avila, who she's compared to in the preface, and then it comes back again in the epilogue. What do you make of that? I think it's really interesting. I mean, I don't know a tremendous amount about Teresa of Avila. She was an important 16th century nun who reformed the Carmelite order. And I I have Catholic friends who are very fond of her. Mm -hmm. Uh, I know that she is considered a a good deal. Do we we think Elliot knows the Bernini statue? I don't know it myself. Ah, St. Teresa in ecstasy. Oh, it's a, it's incredibly beautiful. And, you know, so there's a lot of things to say about St. Teresa, but one of the things that's known about her is, um, if I remember correctly, she wrote about her ecstatic experience as the divine. And, you know, she wrote a lot of other things too, right? But I mean, she writes about her ecstatic experience of the divine. And I'm wondering, is that, I mean, is that, is, is that part of what we're to understand in that comparison? Hmm. Yeah. It might be. Yeah. I mean, it's like very much at odds with the rationality and the sort of commitment to ethical behavior and, you know, the life of the small town that we're preoccupied with in the foreground. I mean, I guess it invites us to think about this question, you know, is Dorothea a religious person? And if so, what would that mean? Like, I don't know, we shouldn't talk about Dorothea all day, but, but it's like, it's an important thing, right? Cause she trans, she's like the circle about which things move, right? The point about which things move. Well, let's talk about that a little bit. We didn't really have a chance to go into George Eliot's biography, but the one thing that we should mention about George Eliot is that one of the things that she had done before she started writing novels was work as a translator. Mm. And she translated a few texts about religion. Mm -hmm. She translated Feuerbach's Essence of Christianity, and she also translated a book by the philosopher Spinoza, his ethics. She is, I believe, the first person to translate that into English. It's the first English translation. Although it wasn't actually published until late in the 20th century. And when she was working on this Spinoza translation or afterwards, she had said in a letter to somebody, what is wanted in English is not a translation of Spinoza's works, but a true estimation of his life and system. Mm. After one has rendered his Latin faithfully into English, one feels that there is another yet more difficult process of translation for the reader to effect, and that the only mode of making Spinoza accessible to a larger number is to study his books, then shut them and give an analysis. Mm. And there's been a lot of argument that Middlemarch is one of those examples of a process of translation of some of Spinoza's ethical ideas. In the sense of, you know, drawing across, like translating it into what it would mean in the world. Yeah. Now, I'm in no way, shape, or form an expert on Spinoza. But one of my understandings of what Spinoza is writing about in the ethics is that he's thinking about this philosophical argument about what is there in the world. And he puts forward this idea that there is one substance where previous philosophers might have said that there were four, you know, everything is made of earth and fire, and or Descartes said there were two substances. He's going to argue that there's one, and that we can call that substance God or nature, and everything within that substance is connected by being part of that substance, but the only entity which has access to that totality of substance is God, mm-hmm. that we only see things narrowly through the blinkers of our own experience, and that in a sense, growing wise is the process of getting past that narrowness and making more connections. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So a lot of Middlemarch is about people who are blinkered by the narrowness of what they can experience, that they see their fellow humans and interpret them through all of their own biases Mm -hmm. and need to learn to be a bit more sympathetic to what their experiences are and have a sense of what what actually is going on inside their heads, what, what actually is motivating them. Mm-hmm. Why do they do the things that they do mm-hmm. and gain greater fellow feeling through yeah. that? Yeah. And as you're saying, it's not just a rational experience, right? Because Spinoza talks about knowledge as being mediated, not just through like, you know, your experiences in the world, like, you know, your rational apprehension of the experience in the world, but also through your emotional engagement. Like that's part of your knowledge, like your way of knowing as well. Um, and, and you see, and that's why, like we said earlier, a character like Caleb Garth, right. is like not a highly educated guy, but he, I think has more kind of moral wisdom than anybody in the book or just about anybody. Right. He's, but he doesn't have to think about it a lot to know what the right thing to do is. Right? And he's not coincidentally the most practical person, right? He's always interested in like business by which he means, you know, making sure things work and like, you know, the houses are built properly and people have what they need, right? There's a really beautiful sequence towards the end of the book between those two visits to Rosamond where 
all of this vivid sympathetic experience that she's just gone through and dealing with this, all this vivid sympathetic experience returned to her now as a power, mm. which seems an interesting point. And then a little while later, she opens her curtains and looks out towards that bit of road that lay in view with fields beyond outside the entrance gates. On the road, there was a man with a bundle on his back and a woman carrying her baby. In the field, she could see figures moving, perhaps the shepherd with his dog. Far off in the bending sky was the pearly light, and she felt the largeness of the world and the manifold wakings of men to labor and endurance. She was a part of that involuntary, palpitating life, and could neither look out on it from her luxurious shelter as a mere spectator, nor hide her eyes in selfish complaining. Mm. And it's that kind of moment that I think she's using Spinoza to draw us to, that she's that she's hoping that people will feel these moments of being able to sort of see and feel yourself as another cog in the world. Yeah. And it's 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 profound and it's like, how can I put it? It's religious without being theological, right? It's like it's a very spiritual sense of who you are and who you are in the world and how you're connected to other people. It's quite extraordinary. Yeah. At one point, Dorothea asks Ladislaw, what is your religion? Says Dorothea. I mean, not what you know about religion, but the belief that helps you most. And this idea of thinking about religion without being weighed down by yeah. religion. And Dorothea says religion, right? What is it he says in response to her? He says something like, you know, basically, I... He I, says, to love what is good and beautiful when I see it. Yeah. And his good is her. Yes. Right? That's the thing that kind of sees him through. The other interesting thing about Spinoza is that, again, to my understanding, which is limited, he was a determinist. He didn't really believe in free will, per se. There was just, this is the world, and we experience it, and we go through it. I don't know if he talked specifically about that, but my understanding is that people have analyzed his work and seen this aspect of him. And you get a similar sense in the way that Elliot is dealing with her characters. You had that in that passage I just read about the involuntary palpitating of the world. Mm -hmm. And you have that, I think, also in some of the ways that these characters do things that you don't expect, but that it feels like they couldn't have done anything else. And Elliot talked about it that way. Well, you know, when, when fans were like, oh, Lydgate and Dorothea should totally get married. That's going to be what happens. Like, no, that's, that can't be what happens <laughs> because that is not who they are. And let me explain step by step. And she makes a convincing argument, but there's a sense in which none, they don't really have a choice in this. People don't really seem to have much of a choice in this. They're just living their lives. I mean, do you think that's true? I mean, do you think we're meant to think that, for example, that Dorothea could not help but marry Kasaman, for example? Like, that's a really interesting question. I think, I think that that seems true. Like, uh. everything about Dorothea is going to make her attracted to Kasaban when she meets him. But don't we get our attention called to things like him? Well, I don't know, right? Like, he, for example, he doesn't treat her gently. He doesn't appreciate her love. But is it the case that he couldn't do anything different? Yeah, and that seems to be why we get this sense of, like, where does he come from? What mm, led to Kasabin mm, being Kasabin? Mm. And can we sympathize with that and understand why he is making the choices that he's making? It's not to say that he's blameless in doing these things, but so can, to speak. But, but, you, but you can choose whether to do good things or bad things, right? Like, for example, there's this wonderful long passage where Bolstrode is trying to decide whether or not to, you know, snuff the guy who holds his guilty secrets, basically. Sure. Right? And he's he's A clearly, whole subplot we're not getting yeah, into. Yeah, a whole subplot we're getting into. But he's clearly, like, teetering on the edge of that decision. And there's this pause. Pause, like, you know, where just in brief, right? He, he, um, somebody's asked him a question outside the door and he's, and they're surprised he hasn't responded yet. Um, and the reason he hasn't responded yet is how he responds will determine whether this other person lives or dies. And you could tell he's like on the edge there, right? So, so but is there determinism? He, he makes his decision by not making the decision. <sighs> he sort of, he tells her himself. where the key to the liquor cabinet He does tell her where the key to the liquor cabinet but it's also the sense of like, well, I'm not really or doing he, he this. he gives or... her the key. Yeah. And and yet, we also find out that this is a pattern of behavior yeah, for him. That's that true. again and again, when, when he's done terrible things, he's sort of gone into the state of, I'm not really doing anything. It's not really me. It's just, yeah. Yeah, it just yeah. happened. And then yeah, that's, that's true. who he is. And 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 yet he is a complicated person beyond that. Yeah, and like yeah. there are other things that are good and bad about him. But I, I think we, we must be meant to be troubled by that, to be perplexed oh, yeah, by yeah, that. Yeah. To what extent are you choosing what happens? And to what extent are you just carried along on the waves? There's a lot more we could say about this massive novel. For like eight hours. In fact, we haven't even talked about one of the main characters in the novel, which is to say the narrator. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, maybe we'll have a chance to do that soon. But we do have to wrap up now. So what are we reading next time? We're reading Hai Im Yaktan by Im Tufail. And this is a 12th century philosophical allegory. It's the second book in our cluster of works that are philosophical novels. It's well, whether we call it a novel or not will be a question, but it's really interesting both in itself and also in terms of the kind of literature that it gave rise to. So that'll be kind of neat. Yeah. Do you want to, do you want to give the like one sentence plot summary? It's basically about what is it that you come into the world with? Like what makes you, you, what, uh, of your mental capacities are formed by nature and what is formed by nurture. And it plays it out in a really interesting way. So I'm looking forward to rereading that and to hopefully getting more people to read it at some point. It's really neat. I mean, even if people just read excerpts from it, I think even that is fascinating. Indeed. Well, in the meantime, if you'd like to get in touch with us, you can email us at spouter at megaphonic.fm or we're on Twitter at The Spouter. We'd love to hear from you. Show notes with links for anything we've mentioned in this episode are at megaphonic.fm slash spouter slash 16. And The Spouter Inn is one of the fancy little podcasts over at Megaphonic FM. So until next time, we'll see you again at The Spouter Inn.